Good morning. Not so much out of tradition or obligation, but in sincerity, I'm appreciative of the music and those people who shared their musical talents with us this morning. I'm also thankful for my brothers who I get to serve with this morning and seek to uh, stand in the stead of Christ. And I'm grateful for each one of you, uh, my church family, who I get to worship with. Uh, brings me strength when I'm down, who I get to learn from. And um, I'm thankful that uh, we have yet another service this morning to worship God together. Uh, I have a brief scripture reading in just a second uh, from 2 Nephi chapter 11, verse 48. If you want to turn there, 2 Nephi chapter 11, verse 48. Um, but I want to speak to the, uh, the meditation that you see listed in the, the bulletin for today. Uh, I hope that you will take that moment quietly today to reflect on um, something that has drawn you closer to Christ, something that will seek to bring a change in your life, uh, whether it be something from the morning worship or Sunday school, something that we talk about here, uh, something from the sermon, something in the, the hymns we sing, the ministry of music that's provided, something where uh, you can ask God to let that become a part of your heart and help to change you. And then, you know, we will all have opportunities as we leave this place to be more actively reflective on our, our service as well as we decide how that's going to impact us in the week, uh, wherever we may go from this place. But um, our monthly theme is um, says they were preachers of righteousness and spake and prophesied and called upon men everywhere to repent. And I think about that as I also think about the ministry that the Williams family brought for us this morning which reflected on some ministry that had been brought previously where we talked about how Jesus changes everything and prayer can change everything. And sometimes that change happens in a moment and comes in those moments of necessity when we need God to be a part of our lives and he steps in and does that. There's other types of change that happens over periods of time. It's slow, it's intentional change, and that's the kind of change that a lot of times we have more control over. So as I think about that meditation, as I think about what I would encourage you to do, I would ask you to consider what are those things that Jesus, our God and our Savior, has done for us that changes everything so that we can begin changing small things or big things. And with all of that in mind, let uh, us be called into worship with the words from uh, chapter 11 in 2 Nephi which reminds us that we talk of Christ, we rejoice in Christ, we preach of Christ, we prophesy of Christ, and we write according to our prophecies that our children may know to what source they may look for a remission of their sins. If you would turn uh, to hymn number 12 in the gold hymnal, we will stand and sing this together. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and the opportunity to come to this house of worship. It is with gratitude that we gather here today to set aside the challenges we face and the troubles that are going on around us. Lord, I pray that we will turn our focus on you and your word, that we might know and feel your presence and love you have for each of us here this day. Pray that your spirit will rest upon Joseph and the message brought forth today will bring us closer to you. Help us to build your kingdom here on earth and to always seek to do your will. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Would you bow with me, please? We greet you, O oh Lord, this beautiful morning in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray that you will help us be generous givers of our money, of our talents, of our time, of our service, of our lives, that we may be part of furthering the kingdom of Jesus Christ, that we will do it joyfully knowing in our hearts that it is an important part of the work here on earth. 
So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for your son, Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. Good morning. <clears throat> what a beautiful day. Uh, it's been a beautiful weekend, uh, leading to a beautiful morning. And the ministry of music this morning uh, truly touched me. I appreciate all those that played and sang and gave of your talents and your gifts. Last week, Marlon talked to us about having a full vision of God's plan in our lives. And that we might not be lost in our own narrow vision of how things should go. Putting our efforts and talents into the building of our own kingdoms here on earth. And he ended by saying that we need to be found more fully engaged in building God's kingdom. That we need to be more concerned with gathering together, not moving further apart. And it really spoke to me when he said that we need to not only share God's vision, but have a renewed conviction to be found engaged in it. It has been said that having convictions can be defined as being so thoroughly convinced that Christ and his word are both objectively true and relationally meaningful that you can act on your beliefs regardless of the consequences. That's powerful. When was the last time that you or I acted regardless of consequences? Consequences to ourselves or even those that we care about. If you're anything like me, every decision you make, every action that you do on a day-to-day -day basis is weighed on what the consequences will mean to yourself and to those you care about. I'd like to talk about a couple stories today and a couple men who uh, acted in a way where they had concern and conviction for those uh, around them sometimes even in spite of themselves. And the first is Abinadi. And he was a Nephite prophet in the Book of Mormon. We know that he prophesied that God would punish the people of wicked King Noah unless they repented. And of course, he was in prison for prophesying the destruction of King Noah and his people. But in the process, he taught King Noah's wicked priests of the law of Moses and the law of Christ and the love of Christ. And we know ultimately he was burned to death by King Noah. I'd like to turn and read some excerpts of that story, um, starting in Mosiah, the seventh chapter, if you want to follow along. We'll be skipping around, hitting highlights for the sake of time. But in Mosiah chapter 7, Verses 1 and 2, we are introduced to King Noah briefly, and um, his father, King Zenith, was a godly man, and it says in verse 1, And now it came to pass that Zenith conferred the kingdom upon Noah, one of his sons. Therefore Noah began to reign in his stead, and he did not walk in the ways of his father. For behold, he did not keep the commandments of God, but he did walk after the desires of his own heart. And the thought occurs to me how many times that exact same sentence could be said about me. It goes on in chapter 7 to talk about how he went from making his own decisions and living his own life to becoming wicked. So much so that he's referred to as wicked King Noah, not just King Noah. And all those in his kingdom became wicked. wicked. And then in the middle of, uh, well, no, the beginning of verse 28, if we skip over to 728, 
we meet Abinadi. And it came to pass that there was a man among them whose name was Abinadi. And he went forth among them and began to prophesy, saying, Behold, thus saith the Lord, and thus hath he commanded me, saying, Go forth and say unto the people, Thus saith the Lord, Woe be unto this people, for I have seen their abominations and their wickedness and their whoredoms, and except they repent, I will visit them in mine anger. And it goes on to rebuke them and to instruct them in the law of Moses. And then in chapter 8, he starts to teach them about the love of Christ and the coming law under Jesus Christ. And I want to skip ahead to Mosiah chapter 8, verse 79. And now if Christ had not come into the world, speaking of things to come, as though they had already come, there could have been no redemption. And if Christ had not risen from the dead or have broken the bands of death, that the grave should have no victory and that death should have no sting, there could have been no resurrection. But there is a resurrection. Therefore, the grave hath no victory. And the sting of death is swallowed up in Christ. He is the light and the life of the world. Yea, a light that is endless, that can never be darkened. Yea, and also a life which is endless, and there can be no more death. Even this mortal shall put on immortality, and this corruption shall put on incorruption. I'd like to hop over to uh, ver- or chapter 9, verse 1. And now it came to pass that when Abinadi had finished these sayings, that the king commanded that the priest should take him and cause that he should be put to death. Skipping down to verse 8 through 15. And it came to pass that the king caused that his guards should surround Abinadi and take him. And they bound him and cast him into prison. And after three days, having counseled with the priest, he caused that he should again be brought before him. And he said unto him, Abinadi, we have found an accusation against thee, and thou art worthy of death. For thou hast said that God himself should come down among the children of men. And now for this cause thou shalt be put to death, unless thou wilt recall all the words which thou hast spoken evil concerning me and my people. Now Abinadi said, to him, said unto him, I say unto you, I will not recall the words which I have spoken unto you concerning these, this people, for they are true. And that you may know that of their surety, I have suffered myself that I have fallen into your hands. Yea, and I will suffer even until death, and I will not recall my words, and they shall stand as a testimony against you. And we know that he was burned unto death. But his conviction and his love for those that he was prophesying and preaching unto did have an effect. If we go back to verse 2 of chapter 9, we read, But there was one among them whose name was Alma. He was also, he also being a descendant of Nephi. And he was a young man, and he believed the words which Abinadi had spoken, for he knew concerning the iniquities which Abinadi had testified against them. Therefore he began to plead with the king that he would not be angry with Abinadi but suffer that he might depart in peace. But the king was even more wroth and caused that Alma should be cast out from among them and sent his servants after him that they might slay him. And over in 28, And now it came to pass that Alma, who had fled from the servants of King Noah, repented of his sins and iniquities and went about privately among the people, and began to teach the words of Abinadi. And it goes on to tell how he 
did a mighty work in bringing men and women to an understanding of Jesus Christ. And he became a great leader in the early church there. And it was all brought to be because of the faithfulness and fearlessness of Abinadi. Not only Alma, but his son, Alma the Younger, who became a great leader and missionary for the Lord. Abinadi had such selfless courage. And you know, when we think of examples of selfless courage, we often think of soldiers on the battlefield um, putting themselves in, in front of danger. But I want to share uh, a couple stories uh, that illustrate that. And they both happened in uh, San Diego. One was in 1959. But I want to start with one more recent. In 2008, on December 8th, a United States Marine Corps two-seater F-18 fighter plane had an engine problem after taking off from the USS Abraham Lincoln during training. And instead of landing at the Naval Air Station that was just north of there, the pilot flew the ailing aircraft towards Miramar. You see, the pilot and the aircraft were a part of a Marine fighter attack squadron located at Miramar. But unfortunately, on his way there, both the aircraft's engines failed. And the pilot decided to eject from the aircraft, which was seconds away from crashing. The pilotless aircraft crashed into a residential area of University City, which was a quarter mile from the University High School and two miles from Miramar. Unfortunately, four people were killed on the ground that day. And the pilot, who had safely ejected, landed just east of the high school that he had missed. And many compared that crash to one that happened in 1959. On September 21st, 2019, a plaque commemorating Ensign Albert Joseph Hickman was added to the Mount Soledad National Veterans Memorial. Albert Joseph Hickman was born in Sioux City, Iowa on April 4th, 1938, and he later graduated from Central High School in 1956, enlisting in the Navy before graduating. Hickman became a naval aviator, and he was assigned to VF-122, a training squadron at Naval Air Station Miramar. On December 4th, 1959, Hickman was practicing carrier landings, and as he returned to Miramar in his McDonald F-3 Demon, the aircraft's engine failed. The aircraft was at an altitude of 2,000 feet when the engine compressor stalled and then surged. And it was reported that Hickman was not, <clears throat> chose not to eject from the stricken aircraft and even opened his aircraft canopy and waved to warn children to, of his aircraft. And all that while steering it away from Hawthorne Elementary School in Claremont, just missing the school fence. Ultimately, the aircraft crashed in San Clemente Canyon, which resulted in the burning of 20 acres of canyon brush. Hickman was the sole fatality. He died in the crash, but saved nearly 700 people, most of them children. Deborah Dawson, who was only eight years old at the time, still remembers witnessing that crash. It was about noontime. We were on the playground, Dawson said. I heard something that made me stop playing and look in the direction of that sound. As I did, I saw a jet coming down in a very controlled glide. It came down just beyond the fence on the other side of the playground. Dawson said the reality of what she had seen hit her when she saw the large fireball. There were children screaming, she said, and I'm sure I was one of them. 
Because of Hickman's sacrifice that day, Dawson was able to grow up and have two children of her own. Saturday morning, nearly 60 years after the crash, she recounted her story at the ceremony when Hickman's plaque was added to the memorial. A 21-year-old man, she said, had the wherewithal and compassion in his heart and the heroism in his soul to not bail out. To not save himself, but to save a playground and a school full of children and teachers, Dawson said to the crowd of people in attendance, She tears up multiple times throughout her speech as she expressed gratitude to the man who died so that her and her classmates could live. It's an honor for me to be able to finally put into words exactly how I felt all my life about Officer Hickman, Dawson said. Hickman was posthumously awarded the Navy and Marine Corps Medal the highest non-combat medal awarded, to, awarded for heroism. Hickman Elementary School in Miramar was also named in his honor, as was Hickman Field in Kearney Mesa. You know, both of those stories are tragic, a tragic result of a set of unfortunate circumstances. But Officer Hickman made a very difficult decision And it came upon him in a very short amount of time. I'm sure he started that flight uh, anticipating that he would land it in the exact same way he had done dozens, if not hundreds of times before. But when he realized that those engines were gone and they weren't coming back, he found himself at a crossroad where he could have started to act in a way to minimize other casualties while still saving himself or sacrifice himself to ensure no others would be affected. And of course, we know he made that very selfless, courageous decision. But why? Why did he care so much about others? You know, it, it reminds me of when Christ told uh, Simon Peter at the water's edge that he was going to make him a fishers of men a fisher of men. And uh, the vision that's brought to my mind is in the, the series, The Chosen. I think it does such a great job of showing the relationship between Christ and his uh, disciples and, and just the emotion of what it would have been like. And, uh, you know, in that episode, it shows Peter as being completely obsessed with Peter and the circumstance that he finds himself in. And Christ, in that moment, is letting him in on the secret that he will, from that moment forward, become a less selfless man, a less selfish man, and a more selfless man. That his concerns will lie less with himself and more with others. And once we enter into that covenant with Jesus and give our lives to him, we find as well that relationships become more important part of our lives. That's when we find that there's joy and strength to be had from fellowship from our brothers and sisters. A desire to see the hurting and hopeless people around us find that same joy that we find through our relationship with Jesus Christ. We want others to know what it feels like to be loved. And so our concern for others is increased. And so it makes me wonder if Officer Hickman had a relationship with his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Like I read that Abinadi said in the eighth chapter of Mosiah, O death, where is thy sting? In this way, it seems that Officer Hickman and Abinadi both came to their crossroads, crossroads where they're concerned and their desire for their own well-being was put behind their desire and concern and well-being for others. And when each one of us come to that crossroads in our life, 
we come to that point when we have a decision lying before us that can affect the rest of our life, affect those around us, those that come behind us for generations, what will we choose? Will we step out and accept that invitation to be baptized? Will we be willing to enter into that covenant relationship with Jesus? Will we accept that priesthood call that we feel unworthy of? Will we follow the promptings of his spirit and speak Christ to those around us at work and school? Will we remove ourselves from those situations on a daily basis that draw us away from him? You know, it could be said that the, the sacrifice of a, of a moment like that, like Officer Hickman made, may be easier than to daily have to make those sacrifices for others and for the Lord, to not live our kingdom and to only care about ourselves. What will we choose when we come to that crossroad? Maybe for many of us here today, today is that crossroad. On that day in 1959, when Officer Hickman decided to go down with that plane, and he made that decision at his crossroad to prefer the others on the ground so that they might have opportunity to live, he created a legacy of love for those that he spared and all those that would come after. Just like Abinadi, who he could have been like wicked King Noah, and he could have said that uh, he was going to live how he wanted to live and care about himself. But he chose to rise up in the face of sure, sure death and persecution and because he loved those people, he prophesied and shared the love of Jesus Christ. And we know that that legacy of love that Abinadi showed to those people in that time was carried on by Alma, by Alma's son, and on and on. Even to us today that read those words, that legacy of love continues. It makes me think of the legacies of love that were made at the crossroads of tough decisions and stepping out in faith of the people that came before me. Most notably, I didn't grow up in the church and, uh, and I was a convert to the church because of my wife, Andrea. And I think of the people in her life her grandparents, great-grandparents who decided to enter the waters of baptism, who decided to follow this restored gospel. Who chose to be faithful saints and to set that example in the lives of their family and their children. And that legacy continues even in the lives and the families of their grandchildren and great-grandchildren even at this point. There's no way at those moments that they had any of those uh, ideas in their heart or in their mind to understand how that would affect so many people they didn't know. But it does, and it did. And our decisions continue to have an effect on so many that we don't recognize And so the question I have for you today is, will we return home the same as we came today? Will we pilot our plane back just like we came? Or will we make a tough decision at our crossroad today?
Will we repent and sacrifice our own personal vision of our kingdom here on earth? Will we be found praying and fasting and sacrificing those things so that we might seek the Lord in all diligence, that we might seek his forgiveness, that we might be strengthened to give of our lives and our time and our talents, that we might be thoughtful in how we react and respond to those around us, that we might find the vision that Marlon talked about last week, the vision not only for me and my life and my goals, but the vision for his kingdom here on earth and his kingdom to come. That we might find and know that our, know our role that we have to play in these last days. Because in the perspective of eternity, we are all living in our last days. Whether you have 30 or 40 or 50 more years in the great expanse of time that is but a moment. And before any of us know it, we will be face to face with our maker and our creator, Jesus Christ. Having to answer for what decisions we made and how it affected those around us and what legacy that left. David mentioned that uh, we're going to have a time of uh, meditation today, and I would hope that each of us could spend some of that time considering Jesus. Considering the power that Jesus has in our lives, and that he's waiting to display in our lives and through our lives. What is he wanting from us? What are we not ready to give him? You know what the lady said of Officer Hickman in her speech? That he gave his life so others could live. But of course, every one of those People he saved have either already died or will die in the coming years. There's only been one who has ever given his life so that we may not die and we could live eternally. And if you don't know him and if you're not walking with him this day, and if you feel like you've strayed away, I pray that you would take time to call on his name, to seek him, and that you might consider at your crossroads this day how you might respond to the call of Jesus and his legacy of love for you. Let's go, I want to read from John chapter 15, 9 and 10, and then I'm going to jump to 3 Nephi 12. As the Father hath loved me, this is Jesus speaking, so have I loved you. Continue ye in in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And now, 3 Nephi 12, 33 through 35. Now this is the commandment. Repent, all ye ends of the earth, And come unto me and be baptized in my name, that ye may be sanctified by the reception of the Holy Ghost, that ye may stand spotless before me at the last day. Verily, verily, I say unto you, this is my gospel, that ye know the things that ye must do in my church. For the works which ye have seen me do, that shall ye do also. For that which you have seen me do, even that shall ye do. Therefore, if you do these things, blessed are ye, for ye shall be lifted up in the last day.
Our Father in heaven, we're uh, thankful for this opportunity that you have provided to us this morning to uh, gather in this place in your house and to uh, worship you. We're thankful for uh, the words that we've been able to hear this morning, and we ask that uh, you would help us to uh, implement those things in our lives that uh, have been shared uh, by our brother. We ask that uh, as we would go from this place, that you would watch over us throughout this coming week, that we may be that light and that uh, example that you've called us to be, that we may, uh, in doing so, that we may uh, further the building of your kingdom, that we would be uh, that people that you have called. We do, uh, again, thank you and, uh, and ask all these things in your son Jesus' name. 